Welcome to the City Church of Dallas web broadcast. God is doing something so awesome. We just finished the service. There's still a, a lingering of the presence of God. It's just special what God is doing. One man today received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. One of our young men, one of our ushers. Open up your heart. Open up your mind. There is a tangible presence of God in this room. God's going to touch you as you watch this broadcast. Thousands of people in countries all around the world on every continent are watching. So get ready for God to move into your life and welcome to City Church of Dallas. Okay, I'll preach fast so we can, we can get out. I'll make a deal with you. I'll preach fast if you listen fast. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible, open up with me to um, Romans chapter 4. I really believe that the word that God wants us to hear tonight will be encouraging. I'm here tonight to encourage myself, to encourage you, for us together as a church. I, I remember whenever um, I was in the automobile business here in Dallas back in the late 80s, and uh, I was attending a church in Farmer's Branch and uh, right at the very beginning stages of when God was speaking to me about going into ministry. And I had a gentleman come up to me and he said, I, I don't usually do things like this. And, and I know there's people that are prophetic people and I've never professed to be one. But I just really felt like God spoke to me to come and tell you that you're a real encourager. You, you really encourage people. There's a real call of God on your life to encourage people. And just your smile and just the what you have to say and just the way that, you know, the way you act around people just is a real source of encouragement. And I've, I've really endeavored to walk in that. And so tonight, I want to, uh, so tonight I want this to be a night of encouragement. Look at your neighbor and say, you're going to be encouraged tonight. I, I, believe that, I believe that no matter how you walked in this place, that I believe the Word of God is going to strengthen your step, put that sparkle back in your eye, put that smile back on your face. And I believe that tonight we're going to be strengthened and encouraged by the Word of God. Are you in Romans chapter 4? Amen. All right, let me get there real quick. Romans chapter 4. This thing turned off on me. And we're going to begin at verse 17. Very familiar passage. Abraham had been promised a child from God. And Paul is writing to the church at Rome, to the people called Romans. He's writing to them about Abraham and about the life of Abraham. Romans 4.17 in the New King James Version says, As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope, believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. Say, strengthened in faith. Strengthened. He was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what, he had, what God had promised, God was able to perform. Do we believe that tonight? Do we believe that what God has promised, God is able to perform? Do we believe that tonight? Okay. Now, go with me to um, Isaiah, a real prophetic thought from Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah chapter 40, Phil Driscoll did a song from this passage many moons ago, Isaiah chapter 40 verse 29. Isaiah 40, 29, in the New King James Version, says this. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not there, say, wait a minute. Okay. Isaiah 40, 29, God.
God gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. What does God increase? God gives power to the weak. God gives what to the who? He gives power to the weak. God gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, the young men shall utterly fail. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll renew their what? Strength. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, run and not be weary, walk and not faint. I want to speak to you tonight out of 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30, beginning at verse 1. Turn over there if you would, please. This is a story, true account, about King David. Whenever he was in the will of God. I mean, he was flowing with God. He was hearing from God. He was listening to, from, uh, listening to the voice of God. He was doing everything within his might everything within his power to flow exactly with what God wanted him to do. And he was right in, as my dad would say, I'm so happy to have my father here with me today. Everybody say, hi, dad. Hi. So thankful he's with us. My dad would say, smack dab in the middle. Y'all ever heard that? Good old Texas term. David was smack dab in the middle of the will of God. And he's out fighting the battles of God, winning the victories of God, and being over, uh, being more than a conqueror and an overcomer for God. And he comes home. He's tired. He's uh, exhausted. He's all excited about getting home to his family. And the Bible says he comes up over the mountain, looks down in the valley known as Ziklag. And turn over there with me. Let's read it with that as a background. 1 Samuel chapter 30, beginning at verse 1. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And here's what it says. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire, had taken captive the women and those who were there. From small to great, they did not kill anyone but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. David's two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughters. But David did what? David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar, the priest, Amma, whatever happened to Joe and Bill and John? And... Okay, uh, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover some of what you lost. Recover a little bit. Recover most. What does he say? You will recover all. And this is what's so incredible about God. One of the many things incredible about God to me. It would be enough for me if it just said, you will recover all. But God puts the cherry on top of the whipped cream, on top of the fudge, on top of the ice cream. Doesn't that sound good? He says, you will recover all without fail you will recover all remember 
Jesus said, you'll tread upon serpents and scorpions. The, the uh, disciples went out and they were all excited. They came back to Jesus and said, we've got power in your name over serpents and, and over the enemy and over the, uh, the attack of the enemy. And he says, you will tread upon serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. God is so all-inclusive. God covers every base. And here he's telling David, you, listen to this. He told David, you are simply thinking revenge, but I'm thinking recovery. Well, where do you get that, Pastor Bob? I don't see that in there. David asked how many questions? He said, shall I pursue and will I overtake? Two questions. What was the answer? Two questions, but God gave him how many answers? You will pursue, you will overtake, and number three, without fail, you will recover all. Man settles far lower than God wants us to have in our life. All that David could think about, the men are trying to stone him. The men said, you led us on this wild goose chase. You have us out there doing all this stuff for God, and we come home and everything's gone, so now we're going to stone you. David is thinking, if I could just get revenge, if I could just get revenge for these men, if we could just get blood for blood, if we could just get these men that killed our family, if we could just kill them and their family, then they won't stone me. And he comes to God, shall I pursue and will I get my vengeance? Will I get revenge? And I can just see him as he's praying. And, and he has the, uh, the ephod there. And he's praying. And he hears God say, yes, you are to pursue. And yes, you will overtake. I can just see him get up and start to walk out. And God say, wait just a minute. That's not all. You will, without fail, recover everything. This is a word of encouragement to many that are here tonight. You have been through so much. You have been following God. You have been working for God. Many times opposition is a better indicator that we're in the will of God than out of the will of God. Because so many people think, man, everything's going wrong. God must be mad at me. Man, God, I must really be missing it. And they, people have come to me and say, Pastor, what do I do to stop all hell breaking loose? I tell them, just stay on track. Just keep doing what you're doing. Because the opposition comes to stop what we're doing for God. So David said, I'm willing to settle for revenge. Because the reason why the Bible was so explicit when he said that the enemy took the children, took the wives, but did not kill them. That was so opposite of what happened in warfare in this time. Because what would happen when a conquering nation would come, they would wipe everything out. They would kill the men and the women and the children. So David, when he saw everything burned, he just naturally thought, they've killed everybody. There's nobody alive. There's nothing left. I have nothing to fight for but revenge. And God says, yes, you have a lot more to, to fight for. You're thinking revenge. I'm thinking recovery. Right, right. So whatever you've been thinking about your situation, Isaiah says God's ways are higher than our ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So I want to encourage you tonight. God has a plan for your total recovery. God has a plan for you to recover everything that's been lost, everything that's been stolen, everything that's been given up. And I, I really think that tonight there's many here not struggling so much with, with what's with what's I can get back, but struggling with is it still alive? Is my dream. See, David was thinking his, his sons and daughters and his wives. Here tonight, I think many people are thinking, is my dream still alive? Is the plan that God had for my life still alive? Is the vision that I had, is the call of God still on? Is my purpose still alive? And I'm here to tell you, yes, they are. Yes, yes. I'm here to encourage you, yes, that God's plan for you is to recover all. Without fail, 
You will not fail in this recovery attempt. Because so many people, they struggle with fear. They struggle with trepidation, anxiety. You know, I really want what God has for me. I really want to recover. I really want restoration, but I don't want to fail again. I don't want to go through the heartache again. I don't want to go through the trial again. And I'm here to encourage you tonight. Yes, you are to get up. You are to pursue, you are to go after it, and without fail, you will recover everything that's been lost. That dream is still alive. That hope is still alive. That plan of God for your life, that purpose, that assignment is still alive. But pastor, you don't know how long it's been dead. You don't know. Jesus came to a woman that was bent over with a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. Didn't matter. Jesus met a man by the pool that had been there for 30 years. Didn't matter. It doesn't matter how long it's been. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. It doesn't matter how dead it looks. You will recover all in Jesus' name. Do you believe that tonight? Now, he said, you are to pursue. You are to get up. You are to pursue. This is God's plan for our recovery. And here's the thought. God has the plan, but we have to make it happen. I want to encourage you tonight. You have the strength to recover all. God gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he does what? He increases their strength. Abraham had been waiting for a son. We read it, Romans 4. Abraham had been waiting for a son for over 25 years. Many theologians think it was over 25 years. And the Bible says he was strengthened in his faith. He, was a, he had the ability to stand in his faith because God gave him the strength to do that. God gives us the strength to go after our recovery. And I want to just go through a little simple, a few steps here. How to get everything back. How to recover all. Because God does the work, but we have to do the walk. Did you catch it? God does the work, but we have to do the walk. We have to go after it. Look at your neighbor and say, we have to go after it. We have to go after it. David asked, do I pursue? I, I want direction here. What, what, what's the plan? God says, here's the plan, and here's how you're going to go about it. You will pursue, and you will overtake. But if David would have sat there, if David just would have sat there, there would have been no recovery, right? Right? If he just would have sat there, he had to get up and he had to go after it. And I want to encourage you tonight. You've got the strength to go after it. You've got everything you need to go after it. And now here's the plan. Here's how we do this. Look at uh, Luke chapter 4. I'm just going to read these real quick to you. Give them to you real quick. Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 says, Jesus was filled with the Spirit and led into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. Jesus was filled with the Spirit and he was led into the Spirit. Here's the, he led into the wilderness. Here's the key. Whatever you're filled with is what you'll be led by. Whatever you're filled with is what you will be led by. And I talk to so many believers. I mean, I... I, I, I really work at, at surrounding myself with, with positive influence and with, with ministers and with people that will encourage me and, and will lift me up. But I talk to so many believers, man, I, I just, and so many ministers, man, I just, I, I, I've got to get some time because, man, my DVR is getting so stacked with, I got eight episodes of this and I got eight episodes of that and, and I got a 12 episodes of this and I'm just going to have to take a whole weekend and just get, get caught up on what's on my DVR. And I just think, 
Whatever I'm filled with, that's what I'm going to be led by. Am I filled with what's on my DVR? Or am I filled with the Spirit? See, we're telling on ourselves. Way too many times we tell on ourselves. And we cry out for help and we say, I, I just don't know. I think I've heard from God, but, you know, I, I, I'm thinking God's telling me something, but it, it may be the devil telling me something. I don't know if it's God telling me to do this. I don't know if it's the devil telling me. If I receive a phone call from my son who's been in my life for 24 years, he doesn't have to say, hello. This is David, your son. Dad, are you there? What does he do? He says, hello, and I instantly know who it is. Why? Because I have a relationship with him. I hear a hello from him, and I don't look to the person in the car with me. I think this is my son. I don't know. It might not be my son. Somebody's telling me hello. I, want, I wonder who this is. No, I instantly know who it is. Amen, Pastor. That's good preaching. I appreciate that. That's a good word. I'll amen my own self. What I am filled with is what I will be led by. Jesus was filled with the Spirit, so he was led by the Spirit. Do I really want to be filled with ABC, NBC, CBS? Do I really want to be filled with ESPN or anything else cnbc msnbc you know have they found the plane yet <laughs> what i am i mean i've talked to some people they can tell you every fact every detail who's looking for what where it is and all this and i'm just thinking what i'm filled with is what i'm going to be led by i'm talking about how to recover all god has the plan god does the work I am all for change breaking. I am all for, you know, the, the, that song that we sing, and I sing it as loud as anybody. I hear the chains breaking. I'm all for the chains being broken. I'm all for deliverance. I'm all for, you know, uh, the, the enemy being cast out, the enemy. I'm all for that. But there comes a time that I've got to walk that thing out. There comes a time that I have to get out of the victim mentality and get realize I've been a volunteer. Is that okay if we, if we talk real tonight? And see, the enemy will allow us to keep on in that mentality. You know, so many things we declare, man, the devil's got this on me and the devil's beating me up and the, devil, and the devil's just sitting back going, I didn't do it, but I'll take the credit. I had nothing to do with it, but hey, I'll take the credit. You bet. That's right. I'm the one that did it. And the devil didn't have anything to do with it. Many things we declare that I've got to have change broken off of, they are listed in Galatians chapter 5 as works of the flesh. Amen? And that's where I've got to walk this thing out. That I, you know, hey, pastor, would you cast this out? I'm sorry, I can't cast the flesh out of you. You and me, together, we have to cast the flesh down. Paul said that we crucify and mortify the flesh daily. That we make a decision that we're going to cast that thing down and not walk in the flesh. Does that make sense? See, Paul put it this way. If you walk after the spirit then you will not struggle with the flesh but if we walk after the flesh then that's where the struggle is going to be god does the work but we have to do the walk we've got to be victorious we got to get out of this victim mentality and understand many things i've declared i'm a victim of i've actually volunteered for that's some real good preaching right there, Pastor. Is that okay? Let's, let's understand that we've been strengthened over those things.
God gives power to the weak. Well, Pastor, this is just a weakness I have. That second piece of coconut pie, that's just a weakness I have. You know, I'm sorry, that, that triple dip at Brahms instead of the tr double dip at Brahms, that's just a weakness I've got. You've been strengthened over that weakness. God gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases their strength. Amen? Amen? And many of that stuff, many of those things that we're dealing with, we're struggling with, I'm sorry, Flip Wilson had it wrong. The devil didn't make you do it. We, we volunteered for it. We did it to ourselves. See, Paul said, don't be ignorant of Satan's devices. Don't be ignorant of the schemes and the wiles. that take. And Satan comes on there and says, yeah, that's right. I've got dominion. That's right. You're right. I am the one doing all that. And all the time, he had nothing to do with it. See, we've been strengthened. God gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases their strength. Abraham was strengthened in his faith. And it's my prayer tonight that you will be strengthened in your faith. That I will be strengthened in my faith. That we as a church will be strengthened in our faith. And we'll be able to overcome the works of the flesh. And walk away from that thing that's holding our recovery back. Does that make sense? All right. What I am led, filled with is what I will be led by. Look at somebody, look at your neighbor and say, get filled with the right stuff. Get filled with the right stuff. Second Kings chapter 3 verse 16. Second Kings chapter 3. We're talking about how to walk this out. We're going to be filled with the right stuff. We're talking about how to walk out our recovery. How to go after and pursue and get everything back. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 16. The people of God had come together. And they were facing an incredible enemy. But before they could go into battle, before they could go into battle, the animals, the horses, the men, the, the warriors, the, the, the army was thirsty. Had had, had had water in days. And they were praying, we need water before we can fight this battle. And in 2 Kings 3.16, and he said, thus says the Lord. They called for the prophet. And they said, we need a word from God. And the prophet said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. Keep going. Make this valley full of dishes, ditches. For thus says the Lord, all of you shall not see wind Neither shall all of you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water, that all of you may drink, both of you, your cattle, and your beast. What he's saying is simply this. Go make the ditch, dig the ditch, prepare a place to hold what I'm going to do. I hope you're hearing with spirit ears. Prepare a place to hold what I'm about to do. And once you prepare it, don't look for it in the natural means. I'm going to make it happen, but it's not going to be how you think it's going to happen. Where does water come from? Rain, right? So, okay, we're going to dig this ditch, and then we're going to start looking for clouds. We're going to dig this ditch, we're going to start looking for the wind, because God's going to bring a big storm, and that's where the water is going to come. No, God said, don't do that. God says, don't look for natural means. Don't look for it to be done the way you think it should be done. So what I'm asking us to do tonight, I'm asking us to dig the ditch in our life. In other words, remove what's not supposed to be there. Remove what we're holding on to that's in the way of God bringing what we need in our lives. Prepare a way, prepare a place to hold what God is about to do. So many of us, our lives are so full of clutter, so full of junk, so full of the non-essentials, so full of the weight. Remember Hebrews chapter 4, lay aside the sin and the weight that so easily upsets what you're doing. The sin, we know, 
The sin, those things we're, we're, we're well familiar with. But the weight are those things that aren't necessarily bad, but are they really good? Are they really necessary? So, so right here, what God is speaking to us, how we recover all, we get rid of the clutter, get rid of the mess. So many of us, our mess is stopping God's message from working in our lives. And we've got to get rid of that mess. Look at your neighbor and say, let's, let's get rid of the mess. Dig the ditch, remove the clutter, and then open your thinking. Expand your thinking. Don't limit this water to just rain and wind. Because I got so many other ways I can make this happen. So many times we get frustrated and we get upset because we don't see things working the way we want them to see or the way we want them to happen or the way we think they should happen. But God is telling them, get ready, dig the ditch. Look at your neighbor and say, dig the ditch. Dig the ditch. And then he says, open your thinking. Amen. We need to start thinking big in small places. But many of us were thinking small in very big places. God says, open your, open your thinking, expand your mind, and watch how I'm going to make this happen. So the Bible says they did that. The next morning, the water just appeared, and the ditches were full, and the victory came. So I want to encourage you tonight. If you'll dig the ditch, God will fill it. If you'll prepare the way, if you'll prepare for the miracle, if you'll remove everything that's not necessary, if you'll remove the non-essentials, if you'll lay aside the weights, those weighty things, those things that weigh us down, God will make it happen. Look at your neighbor and say, God will make it happen. When you dig the ditch, God will make it happen happen and last one I got to quit Isaiah chapter 40 are we learning anything tonight Amen. Isaiah chapter 40 God gives power to the weak and to those who have no might he increases their strength for those that wait on the Lord oh we hate that word Wait. We hate that word, don't we? They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 21. Just let me quote it to you. Lamentations 3, 21. If not for the compassion of God, we would be consumed. It actually starts with this thought. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. In other words, I'm going to think about this and it's going to bring hope to my life. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. If not for the compassion of God, we would be consumed. But his mercies are new when? Every morning. His mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness unto us, O Lord. We can quote that, but if you keep reading, it says, Blessed is the man that hopes silently and waits silently for the Lord. God spoke to Joshua and said, come here, I want to show you something. And Joshua walked out and he said, see, I've given this city into your hand. The walls were still there. Jericho was still there. The, the army was still on top of the wall. The people were still in it. And God said, see, I've given this city into your hand. If you can see it, you can seize it. If you can see it done in the spirit realm, you can have what God has for your life. See, I've given this into your hand. Now here's the plan. I want you to march around it six times. Once a day for six days. Don't say a word. Those that wait silently for the Lord. Those that wait silently for the Lord. 
Six times. Don't say, seventh day. I want you to go around it seven times. Don't say a word until that seventh time. Then I want you to shout the victory. Why did he say that? Why did he say, don't say a word? My father will tell you, I, I was number three of four. And there was four of us in the house. Four A-type personalities in the house. And he and my mom taught us very young, if you can't say anything good, nice, then don't say anything at all. God did not want them talking themselves out of the miracle. Don't say a word. Don't say a word. Walk around. Don't say a word. Those that wait silently. And why is he saying, why does Jeremiah write that in Lamentations 3? Because while we're waiting for the Lord, our flesh is crying out, I want it now. See, I'm going to write a book, and I'm going to title it, The Mentality That Is Stopping So Many of Us Believers. I only want two things in life. I want it all, and I want it now. Is that too much to ask? Just two things. That's all. Just two things. I want it all, and I want it now. Those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. But we've got to wait silently. Because our flesh, our mouth, will get us into so much trouble. How long am I going to have to wait? How long is this going to happen? What is going on? God, won't you see what's going on? God, don't you know what's happening down here? God, aren't you paying attention? Wake up, God. Don't you see what I'm going through down here? And, we start, and then off it goes. And there we go. Those that wait silently for the Lord. I would rather, here's a deep thought, I would rather play catch up than clean up. I would rather wait on God and just let everything go by. Wait on God, just let everything happen. Wait on God and then when God's ready, you know God can catch you up real quick. Instead of getting out in front of God and always having to clean up a mess. I would rather play catch up. Look at your neighbor and say, it's better to play catch up than clean up. Those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. We're going to mount up with wings as eagles. Why did he say that? Because, yeah, if you're waiting on God, there may be some catching up to do. But you're going to have the wings of eagles to do it. You're going to run and you're not going to be weary. You're going to walk and you're not going to faint. See, you will recover everything. Father, I pray for every person here tonight that's in recovery mode. I believe this is a word in season for every person in this place. Every person that's listening by tape. By CD, I pray, Father, right now that they will be encouraged, strengthened in their faith. I pray, Father, right now that you will give power to the weak. And to those who have no might, you will increase their strength. I pray, Father, right now, those that have settled for revenge, you'll open their hearts to restoration. That you will bring us to a higher level of faith tonight. That we will see total recovery. Total restoration. With every head bowed and every eye still closed. The rest of the story says that David went after the enemy. Found a servant boy that knew where the enemy was. And David battled with the enemy. Got all of his sons and daughters. Everything that was lost. The Bible says in verse 20. And David recovered all. 
what God promises He will perform in our lives. And God is promising you tonight recovery. And He will perform that in our lives. I want to pray for those. Maybe tonight you haven't started your walk with God. You're here tonight. No one's ever told you the good news gospel. Number one, the gospel in 60 seconds is very simply this. Number one, God loves you. Right where you are, God loves you. No matter where you've been, what you've done, God loves you right here, right now. Number two, sin separates us from that love. Mistakes, failure, bad choices. Number three, Jesus is real. He really was born of the virgin. He really did die on the cross. He really was raised on the third day to destroy the power of sin off of your life. And number four, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. And we're going to give you that opportunity to call on the name of the Lord. Maybe no one's ever shared that with you. No one's ever explained the good news gospel. I just shared it with you, and I'm going to ask you to pray with us tonight to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Maybe tonight you're running from God. Maybe tonight you were close to God and something happened, and now you find yourself estranged away from God. Tonight you can come home. He wants you back. If you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, that's me. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Pastor, I want to come back to Jesus tonight. Would you simply just lift your hand so we can pray with you? Hands going up everywhere. Just keep that hand lifted. Let's all pray this together. Maybe your hand's not lifted, but you can pray it with us. Let's all pray it out loud. Say, Father God in heaven. Come on, pray it out loud. Father God in heaven. I ask you now. Forgive me of my sin. I've missed it. I messed up. And I need you, Jesus, to be the Savior of my life. I confess tonight with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord and that you raised him from the dead. And I thank you now I am born again. I am forgiven. I'm on my way to heaven. And I pray right now, fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's thank him for it today. A new beginning, a new start, a new season, a new life is ours. In Christ Jesus. Amen. I want to, like I started tonight, I want to finish with this thought. Be encouraged. Romans chapter 8 so definitively says, God is on your side. If God is for us, who can be against us? Right? Say that with me. If God is for us, Come on, say it like you're yelling at your kids. If God is for us, who can be against us? Nothing, no one, nobody can be against us because God is for us. And God is for this church. God is for this church. And I want us to, before we leave, one more thing. I want us to. Thank you so much for watching this web broadcast of City Church of Dallas. God is doing so many things. It's blowing my mind. I thought we would be a local church, but we'd become an international church through the internet. So what I want you to do, we have people in Iowa, people in Michigan, people all over this country that are sending in support. And because our church is bigger than this room that we're in, and you can feel the actual presence of God, and you are ministered to right over the internet. So if God should lay it on your heart, I want to encourage you to tie. If you don't have a home church, if you have a home church, tie there. If you don't, send your tie then here to City Church of Dallas. Go to City Church of Dallas. This is how you spell it. 
www.thepowerbank.com. You can pay on PayPal there, a secure website, or you can send into the address or call in your gift. I promise you, lives are being changed through our prison ministry, nursing home ministry, our AIDS ministry. We feed the hungry, and God is really doing something special. But we're only a little bit more than a year old, so we need people to give. God bless you. I appreciate it with all of my heart.